Great. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Caitlin. Today we're going to be talking to Morgan, who is a research associate at the Allen Institute for Immunology. This is Behind the Scenes of Science, a series for students like you to learn about career pathways in science, what does a day in the life of a scientist look like, and how people go from being a high schooler to having a career in the world of science as a researcher or anything else. So I'm going to start us off with a few questions for Morgan to get us going, and then we will have lots of time for questions from you. So down in the footer of your Zoom window, you should see a button that looks like two uh, speech bubbles and it says Q&A underneath. So go ahead and use that button to ask questions and we will ask those of Morgan. So to get us started, uh, can you tell us about your science journey from high school to now? Sure, I'd love to. Um, hi everyone, I'm Morgan. Um, I went to high school in El Paso, Texas, and just like you guys, I took as many AP, pre-AP science courses I could. Um, I actually did not ever take AP Chem, so I'm glad you guys are liking it. I wish I had the chance. Um, it just didn't fit my schedule. But I took AP Biology, Physics, and I knew that Biology was something I was really interested in. And so then I went to college in Boston, and I decided to major in Biochemistry. And um, so I took my first like real chemistry wet lab course there. And, and it what was college? Boston University. So um, yeah, the chemistry classes were really fun. Um, I don't know what high school chemists like, but I know in college you get to do a lot of fun experiments at the bench top. So for me, that was awesome. I just love being in the lab. I love actually working like with liquids, with chemistries, like pipetting, doing that physical kind of work. Um, so yeah, so I did four years and during my senior year, I actually started an undergraduate research project um, in a molecular biology lab. We worked with Drosophila flies studying their microbiome that they naturally have. And um, so I got to do a lot of the crossover between biochemistry lab experiments in a biological model system. So um, from that, I really started to get more and more interested in the biology aspects and how it applies to real world, to model organisms, to humans, to medicine, that kind of thing. So um, I also did a lot of pre-med classes. Um, I am applying to medical schools for 2022. So um, that is kind of the career path I'm on. And for these last, for this past year and this next year, um, I have my first like real world science job as a research associate at the Allen Institute. Um, studying immunology and its connection to several diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, multiple myeloma, IBD, and COVID now. So that's kind of the short version of it. Yeah. Well, let, can you tell us about what an average day looks like, speaking of what you do for your research, um, and how that has been affected by COVID? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so at first, I actually joined, got this job right before COVID started at like the beginning of February. So I was here for about four weeks before we shut down. And then I was working from home for about two months. That mostly just looked like um, reading papers, trying to plan projects for when we would be allowed back in the lab, getting organized and just doing a lot of at-home learning, um, getting myself caught up. And, but I've been back in the lab since May and working full time and we do, Day in the lab just looks like um, we have a pipeline process. So I do something on a summary regular basis, you know, every other week, pretty much the same process where we take patient data, patient cells, samples, and I make next generation sequencing libraries from those samples, which we sequence. And then we have a computational team that looks at that data. And then we have data review meetings where we see what kind of what we're looking at um, across different patients, across different timelines and in both healthy and disease states, what the differences is in cell types and gene expression and gene accessibility. And um, yeah, so my, so my day, some weeks look mostly just processing that pipeline, running those patient samples through our sequencing pipelines. And then in the off weeks, we do experiments to either delve further into that data to, um, work on new kinds of assays, assay development. Um, yeah. So the Allen Institute for Immunology works with patients who have various immunological conditions and also people who have 
healthy, typically functioning immune systems, but it's not a clinic. You're not treating people who have these, these conditions. So how, how do you, um, how do you work with those samples? What are you looking for? Can you talk about the basic research that you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. You're right. It's not a clinic. We do not, um, we're not trying to treat patients now, but we do have translational goals, meaning that the patients we're looking at, the diseases we have, we have the goal of finding ways for medicine to help them um, in the clinic so that we're just a step before the clinic. Um, so the, the research I do um, looks at either the mRNA expression, so the gene library expression, what genes are actually turned on in which patients, in which cell types, and at what point in their disease. So lots of complicated metadata um, associated with each of that. In addition to the mRNA expression, we look at our, um, the actual gene accessibility profile, meaning is a gene turned on now or is it poised to be turned on? Um, is it completely shut down as in we're not gonna get any gene expression from that? And that changes also between different cell types and patients along the disease path. Um, at the same time, I don't personally do this, but some of the team look at protein expression. They look at that using flow cytometry, so what proteins are on the expressed on the outside of the cell. We're trying to look at intracellular protein expression as well. And, um, and then our computational biologists try to link all that data together. The gene expressions, the gene accessibility, the protein expression, so kind of the entire state of the cell, of each of the different kinds of mutant cells in these patients. So hopefully from that, we can find what, what is going wrong, what looks different in patients with diseases, where that difference starts in the gene expression profile and how we can target that. Great. Um, so you have been in the job for just about a year. Mm -hmm. What is your favorite thing about it? My favorite thing actually is seeing the data. I don't know much about data science. It's all really over my head. And I think that the work that the computational folks do is just incredible. They work with so like incredibly high volume amounts of data. And it's very complex with the metadata and the several different types of data that we generate in the lab. And they put it all together to try to make a story and try to make sense of it. And I think it's really neat. I mean, I love working at the bench shop, but it's really great to see what I do actually show up in graphs and datas and like part of a bigger story. So for me, that's really exciting, especially because I wish I knew more about it. I'd like to learn more. And I have some fun data that you've given me. Yes. Would you like to explain what we're about to look at? Sure. Um, great. So this is just a personal favorite plot of mine, just because it looks like a chicken. It's a chicken plot. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with chickens, of course. This is looking at different types, cell types, so B cells, T cells, um, natural killer cells, innate cells, like different kinds of immune cells in a plot um, distribution like this. Um, but again, I just shared it with Caitlin because I thought it was a fun shape. So, you know, adds a little brightness to the day. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, so, you know, science is great. We do a lot of awesome things in our work, uh, but sometimes science doesn't quite work right. Um, and we have uh, some experiences that didn't quite go as planned. So can you tell us about your best science failure, your best learning experience, funniest thing, most surprising? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the first thing that came to mind is uh, when I was at Boston University undergraduate, we were planning this experiment, another lab in a different building, got a brand new machine, a fluorescence expression like monitoring machine. And um, we, the PhD student I was working with was really excited and kind of just wanted to get to use it and play with it. So we had designed this experiment that took several weeks to set up and we were ready to do it. And it was gonna be over two days. So we started it on one day and the next day we come into the lab and there's a blizzard because it's Boston and we would have to take our samples outside across the street to another building in order to use this machine. And we just didn't want to risk, I mean, even in good conditions, it'd be risky to like carry samples in an ice box across the street, but with winds and snow, it just, it wasn't going to be possible. 
So weeks of planning had to be rescheduled and we started over, but you know, life such as life, weather takes precedence, I guess. And, um, and we did it again later and it worked just fine, but yeah. Yeah, that's a great one. Um, well, so we have some questions from our audience now. Um, so you've talked about your favorite thing in your job, but you know, we don't love everything about our jobs. What is uh, a less favorite thing? A less favorite thing would just be, um, just because I find it more boring and tedious, the paperwork of just, um, because we work with human samples, everything has to be tracked um, for um, IRB, um, which I can't remember what that stands for right now, review board. Institutional reasons. review board. Yes, exactly. So we work with human samples. So everything that we do with these human samples has to be meticulously tracked. And then, you know, we work with thousands and cells, millions of cells over the year and tracking which sample was under which conditions for the to go into the data pipeline and come back. Like, it's just a lot of organization and tracking and it takes some time. It's not my favorite part of my job, but. Yeah, it's it's so important yeah. to do all of that paperwork, but it, it is a lot of work. It is. Um, yeah, but there are also really rewarding things. Um, our next question is, what is the most rewarding discovery that you have made? For me personally, um, I've gotten to get involved with some methods development research, which is not something I knew I would be doing when I started this job. That's just something that kind of has happened. So um, it's been particularly rewarding for me because it's not something I ever imagined doing. I didn't know I could do it and like actually helping to develop techniques and assays that we will use here, but also eventually be published and other people will use in other labs. Like that for me is very exciting. Can you talk about how methods development research is different from research using established methods? Sure. Like what's so, the experience like for you as well as uh, sort of what does it mean in terms of the research as itself? That is research that is just, is a lot more troubleshooting. I mean, we don't know if something is gonna work. We have different theories. You know, you try to study the chemistry of it beforehand, but you know, you try something in the lab, it doesn't work you figure out why you go back, you try many different ways until you can kind of narrow in. And this could be anything small from you wanna change a buffer so that you can use a standard assay on a different cell type, but that doesn't necessarily always go to plan or something big, like we have one assay, we have an entirely separate assay. Can we put those together in one workflow on one cell and do get two different libraries out of that? Um, there's a lot of technical difficulties in that. And for me, it's all very new. So I'm happy to like help and learn and troubleshoot some of these things. But um, it's not just taking cells, running them through a standard assay and looking at the data. It's actually looking at each step of the protocol and seeing if something went wrong and how you can improve that. Yeah, well, going back to your educational journey, Next question is, what did you think about the STEM programs at BU? Um, and to expand on that, how would you uh, suggest to a student who is applying to college that they think about the programs at the colleges they are considering? Sure. Um, I chose BU particularly for two reasons. Um, these are things I was looking at different colleges. One was the ability or how many undergraduate students could participate in research. That's definitely something I knew I wanted to do. For me, I think it was important to, because I was also considering medical school or research or a PhD, and I wanted to get hands-on research experience as early as I could. So BU has a really high percentage. They actually have, a, you can do research for credit. I'm sure lots of schools have this, but this is one thing that I looked for. The other thing that I looked for was a pre-med or science track that would allow me to study abroad. Um, so I actually studied abroad in Germany for four months um, and still took my organic chemistry there. Um, I did like a kind of a mini research project there. Um, I took cell biology in Germany. So I wanted a school that would allow me to not fall behind in my studies and also study abroad. So those are two things I looked for. Um, I also wanted to kind of just change my scenery, which is why I went from Texas to Boston, the East Coast. Um, but yeah, I was just looking for a school that had a strong science program, um, but also had a strong, I get, like studying abroad and a strong extracurricular life because I wanted to be involved in lots of things as an undergrad, um, which I was. So 
is a good school for me for that. But yeah, those are the things that I looked for when I applied. Uh, well, we have some more questions from the mm -hmm. audience. Um, but before that, uh, what do you like to do outside of work? You mentioned those extracurriculars in college. Yeah. Um, when I was in college, I was very involved with Jewish student life on campus as well. Um, I was part of an organization called Hillel. And so I was part of the board for three of my four years there. I was on student government for a year. Um, and I like doing things like that. I was also part of a women in science and technology group that did like fun, just get togethers to like, it was just, you know, women supporting women, undergraduates and graduates working together, um, which for me was a very fun social experience to have. Um, now I also, um, I work and I have a dog at home that I go to the dog park all the time with. And I love going hiking and walking around the city and hanging out with friends and family safely when I can. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I earlier in your education back in high school, how do you recommend students in high school get started in your field? How do they get from being a high schooler to working in immunology besides taking AP classes? What kind of extracurricular or volunteer activities did you do as a high schooler? Um, as a high schooler, I was really interested in um, just community service. I was part of Key Club, um, so we did monthly community service projects, and I was part of the um, NIH, National uh, Institutes of Health. Nope, that wasn't it. It's it, Now I'm going to forget what this is called. It's just like the standard. It's an academic Oh, um, not not the NIH, NIH, a different one. No, yeah, NHS. I don't, you know what? I'm sorry. I'm blanking on this. This is showing my age. Um, but it was another club where you had to maintain a certain grade point average and had to complete a certain amount of community service hours. Um, those were the two things I did. Oh, and I was part of choir because I just like to sing. And it was just a fun, like, stress-free other thing. I think for me, I've always loved like a science aspect and I've always had like a other aspect like you know a total brain break from the research and just something that was more fun and exploring something different so in high school I did choir I was a gymnast um, in college I was part of Jewish life and um, women in science life and like social clubs like that um, I think that definitely helped me get into school I when I went to college I didn't continue choir or gymnastics so it wasn't that those were passions that I want to focus as a career. I just think it was something that for me helped me maintain a like well-balanced life. And so when I was doing, I don't know, I think burnout is something that is real in college and just in life in general. I think it's important to try to balance your life and find things that are stress-free and fun and enjoyable and give you social support as well. So. Yeah. Um, so at the Institute, um, you've been there for about a year now, and it has not been exactly a typical year, uh, but what do you find most surprising about your job that you did not realize was going to be part of it when you started? Um, I think we've talked about this a little bit, but the methods development work was not something I was really aware of that would be part of the job or something I really expected to do, particularly as a entry level research associate. Um, I was expecting to do more of the, the pipeline assays, just running something through a set protocol and trying to get good results um, every time, which is definitely part of my job. But there's also that troubleshooting aspect of trying to develop something, obviously not on my own, but with support of other colleagues. Um, that's something I wasn't expecting, but that's been very enjoyable. Yeah. So the Allen Institute has these three core principles about our research. It's big team and open science. So mm -hmm. big science, meaning collecting these massive data sets from many patients, collecting many, uh, many markers of their immune function. Open science, meaning ultimately we release all of our data publicly. Um, and team science. So you work on a large interdisciplinary team and that is the topic of our next question. Can you talk about the people that you work with? Um, both about the work environment and about the range of expertise represented on your team. Yeah, absolutely. So as far as the work environment goes, um, there's a group of RAs, RAs ones, twos, threes, who are mostly doing the in-lab work. Um, so we see each other 
in person at the lab more often. Um, and we do kind of help each other out. Um, different people of expertise, for instance, on different kinds of machines that we have in the lab or just how to do different assays. And for our experimental work, there's a lot of crossover between our experimental immunology group, which they know more about the actual immunology cells and their protein expression, and our molecular biology group, which knows more about how to sequence and how to examine cells, but not, I mean, I don't know that much about the immune system actually, but other people on our team are trained immunologists, they know, and they, so, I mean, there's a lot of back and forth in that way about looking at the actual bio, biological questions, what we're trying to study from the cell type with this expression and how we actually study that, whether it's sequencing or flow cytometry or doing protein assays. Um, so yeah, so, and then we have a computational biology team, which tries to look at all the data and from the different platforms, put it together and try to make make it make sense into a story um, per cell, per patient, per experience, um, like disease or healthy, I mean, experiences. And um, yeah, and there's definitely a lot of back and forth between us and the computational biology team as well, because they're trying to, trying to not only see what differences are per cell, but what differences would we expect to see for the different assays round for different pipelines, you know, if, if there were any deviations in the workflow, we report that to them so they can see if it affected the data quality um, because we do hope to get a really high level of data quality for every sample. But obviously, you know, life happens, things happen, sometimes things are different. So we really try to track that data very meticulously so that we know what we're seeing is biology and not just human error, workflow error. Um, unknown other error. So um, yeah, there's definitely so much communication across the teams in setting up experiments as well as going back and looking at the data afterwards in future planning. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of time, not just at doing the experiments, but keeping track of what you did. A lot of time keeping records. Yes, and are keeping critical. track. Those records are critical. Yeah, absolutely. And using that what we did, what the results were to plan our next steps, constantly going back to look at what just happened to redefine what our next steps will be. Yeah. So uh, you have talked a little bit about the research that you did while you were in college. Can you talk mm -hmm. about that research, uh, other internships that you did and how you think it has benefited you in this position? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and actually that's a good point going back to a question about like what I did in college, another thing, that how I got the research job actually was I was a work study student who just freshman, sophomore year was working in the stock rooms of the labs. Um, it was, you know, I worked five to 10 hours a week, um, just like organizing reagents, cleaning the lab classrooms, um, things like that. But that actually helped me. Um, so my manager there then recommended me. So she, I told, I was talking to her and I was less interested in chemistry and more interested in like biology. So she helped me switch into a work study position in the fly lab. And then I started talking to the PhD students and the grad students there about their research and then um, approached them about starting research there. So that also I think is a helpful tip, you know, just start talking to people. If you find something you're interested in and there are students working on the same thing, like they're interested in it too, talk to them, ask them questions. It's something they're also passionate about. So, you know, people love to talk about their research. And then when you find what you're passionate about, you know, you can just kind of laying that groundwork for when you're, if there's like a structured system, like at my school to start research or whether it's just volunteering or helping out in the lab, however it works at different colleges. But yeah, so that research was um, working with flies and they had, well, all insects actually have this bacteria um, called Wolbachia that lives inside their cells. It's an endosymbiotic intracellular bacteria. And um, we were studying it in particular because in mosquitoes, which are a huge public health concern because mosquitoes spread all sorts of diseases. Um, in our case, we were particularly looking at Zika and dengue fever, not malaria, which is a different kind of pathway. Also spread by mosquitoes, also very important. But we were looking at these mRNA viruses that infect mosquitoes and then are passed to humans. And there's this bacteria that naturally lives in mosquitoes and flies, which we use as a model system that 
can alter that infection pathway and even possibly prohibit mosquitoes from passing on those viruses to humans. So that was like the ultimate goal of that research. I was looking in the model organism, just we, our lab was just trying to understand fundamentals of that relationship between the bacteria and the flies, like metabolic pathways. Like why do bacteria live there? How do they thrive? How do they migrate? Um, so that we could use that knowledge for real world applications at some point. So we have a few related questions about um, sort of the, the personality and the, the stress of research. So um, what kinds of personalities do you think are well suited to immunology research, things that you should enjoy in order for this research to be a good fit for you? And also about things that um, may cause stress in the research and how to mitigate that. So sort sure. of two related questions there. Sure. Um... So I think uh, personality-wise, things that help in research, or at least immunology or bi biology research, um, detail orientation is going to be important in any research field. Again, you have to take meticulous notes. You have to track all your samples. Um, and if that is not something you like to do, I could see it being a huge drag. But if you, it, it's always important to stay organized. So that's just a baseline helpful. I think also um, some of the experiments that I run compared to like flow cytometry, they take a lot longer. Some of my library preps take full, three, four days. It's like long hours. Um, and you have to like being in the lab, pipetting liquids, um, you know, running incubations. It can be a lot of waiting time. It can be a lot of downtime or a lot of repetitive movements um, when you're actually at the bench top. So, you know, again, you have to be willing to do that. I wouldn't say go so far as say you like doing that. I don't think anyone enjoys waiting, like sitting for five minutes, pipetting a few things, sitting for five minutes. Like it can definitely be tedious. But if you enjoy what you're doing, and if I, for me, like I always have the larger picture in mind. I'm trying to keep track of the actual, what's actually happening to the DNA in my samples. Because um, for me, it's more interesting that way. It's not just clear liquids and clear liquids all day long. Um, I also think wanting to learn in any kind of research is always going to be important because you're always starting with a question trying to find the answer you're going to be doing literature reviews to see what other people have done you're going to need at some point to troubleshoot things so you have to be okay with failing and learning and trying trying different things and maybe it doesn't work and try something else and i mean i think in any research that's also going to be important um the second question is like mitigating stress. Is that right? Yeah, the, yeah. What, about the things that you enjoy and then also on the flip side of that about mitigating stressors. Yeah, um, I think, I mean, I think the most stressful thing for my work is sometimes I can spend three days trying something and I won't know until the, well, three days sequencing something, sending that data out, it takes a week to sequence, then you have to process the data it could be a month later when I find out it didn't work. And then I have to remember what I did, go back, try to find solutions. That definitely can be frustrating. Um, but I mean, it's it's just part of science. I mean, I think no one has the expectation that everything's gonna work all the time. That that doesn't happen. So sometimes things fail and you have to go back and that, that's okay. So I think understanding that is always important too. Yeah. So you talked about how in lab that you spend a lot of time doing many steps that lead up to a final result, which can take a long time. So, mm -hmm. you know, how many of these, how many of these tasks are different or do you do the same thing regularly? And also um, the relationship to what is happening scientifically. It's not just these mechanical tasks, but uh, different scientific steps. Right, so um, just kind of as an overview, um, so for library prep, so that is like a general term for when you have DNA and you need to make it into something that can be sequenced. So you can actually you know, get the sequence of that DNA. At some point you have to, there's some basic steps. So there's many, many different kinds of library preparations out there. Some of them are targeting different regions of the DNA or um, DNA that, I mean, for instance, like some of my work is targeting only DNA that's accessible physically in 
chromatin or chromosomes versus closed DNA. Um, so there's lots of different kinds of lever prep, but ultimately at some point you have to fragment the DNA. So you have to have like a cutting step. You have to um, add on adapters. You have to add on indexes. These are short sequences that you know that will either help it um, actually physically help it sequence or help primers add on so you can duplicate strands or help just index it so that when you read out the data, you have these little like barcodes so you know which sample it is or, you know, um, so that you can keep track of all the many, many different samples you have. Each of those steps are, are gonna be similar. You're gonna add an oligo, you're gonna anneal it. You have to clean up the extra. So, so oligos that didn't bind, you have to wash those away somehow. So those are a lot of the repetitive steps where you add something, you incubate it, you clean it, you do it again, you do it again, you amplify it, you clean it. Um, you know, it, it can get repetitive, but each one you're actually adding a new piece of information that when you do see, that it will either help it to physically sequence or will add information during the sequencing step that you can process so that you can say, oh, this was this patient, this part of the DNA. It was under these conditions. So yeah, like step by step, it can feel repetitive, but they're all equally important. They're all actually unique in terms of what's being done. Um, so I don't know, just try to keep that in mind. Yeah. yeah. Um, so as we've discussed, you work in a large interdisciplinary team. Um, what do you enjoy about collaborating with that larger group when doing research? Um, I think it's great because people here are from so many different backgrounds. People have been in more industry kind of pharmaceutical research or more academic research, um, studying immune systems, studying protein expression, studying molecular biology, like sequencing methods. Um, like all in all, we have such a vast array of experiences. So we have these big team meetings um, once or twice a week. We go over data. People will put in their their thoughts or their views or, oh, did you also think about looking at this? Like I've worked a lot with macrophages, for instance. I mean, I haven't, I'm just speaking as someone else on the team. Like I've worked a lot with this cell type and I know that sometimes they can express these proteins and they can like self inhibit or self express other kinds of um, factors. Like we look a lot at stress um, induced signaling in cells, which shows if it's inflamed or not. Um, so so many people have different pieces of knowledge and at these meetings, it really all comes together. People, you know, throw out ideas that people will try or different kind of just things that they know from other experiences that will be helpful. Um, that not everyone can know everything. So it's, for me, it's really enjoyable to just watch all the different perspectives come together to try to address one problem. And speaking of uh, getting skills from many different experiences, um, what kinds of skills from outside of work or school have you found useful in your work? Well, that's an interesting question. Outside of work or school. Question. Yeah. Um, skill, um, I, I mean, <laughs> I don't know if this counts as outside of school, but I think a good being able to read and interpret data um, is definitely a good skill to have just for personal development as well as you're learning new things, having that, I guess, curiosity to dive in deeper and teach yourself, teach, learn on your own, find areas that you would like to know more that will help you probably in unknown ways in the future. But at some point you're gonna be like, oh, I'm so glad I studied that particular disease because it's come up in my research, you know, three years later. Um, so I think just being curious and and wanting to look more in is important. Um, but I'm trying to think like outside of academic skills, probably patience in the lab is important. Um, and um, I don't know, <laughs> multitasking, like these are all very general. I'm trying to think of specific things. I think a lot of the the skills that come from those extracurricular activities are the very general ones often things like yeah, being, I think so. being patient yeah mm -hmm. yeah well so we are just about out of time so this will be our last audience question okay 
uh, what were some of the biggest motivators for you going into this field and what got you interested in science, both broadly and this specific area of science? Um, so this specific area I can answer first. Um, I study in class, I didn't take like a, a biotechnology class. I imagine like, I didn't know a lot about the different ways you approach biology questions. I just knew like actual, like cellular biology, molecular biology, like straight sciences that you learned, but not how people learned those things. So I became really interested when I first started reading and hearing about sequencing and like how much of a powerful tool that was. And I was really wanting to get more experience with next generation sequencing because there's, it's just, I think for me, it's such an incredibly powerful and informative tool that just seemed really cool. So um, coming to this job, that was definitely something about the position that I was really excited about that I was looking for. I think science in general, um, I've always been interested in medicine and science. Like from middle school, I had a really great teacher who really just got me interested in science, just made it look like such a cool story. Um, like overall, like how science is really involved in, in everything, like chemistry, physics, biology, like it's everywhere. So um, just from a young age, I was really impressed, I think, with how cool science was. And then going, going forward, I started learning about these technologies, getting more and more interested in this specific field. And I'm just very lucky to have this job to get to keep learning about it now. What do you wish more people knew about your work, about working in a lab or about immunology? Um, I think working in a lab, I shout out to your high school classes. I use my high school math all the time, like just molarity, concentrations, volumes. Like I really do use that math every day. So it's important. It's not a waste of time and definitely feels like a waste of time when I was in high school too. But um, I mean, working at the bench shop, it's, it's great. And I think as far as immunology goes, I just think, I think probably it's overlooked a lot. It's a very complex system. I mean, it, it's, an, it, it's an entire system, like your circulatory system, like your um, neuron, your nervous system. And I just think there's so much that is unknown about it and a lot more research is needed. And I just think, yeah, I think it's starting to become more and more popular, but it's maybe behind the times of some of these other medical research groups. Do you have any last thoughts that you want to share with these students? Um, I don't know. Keep up last all your good school work. It's great. Yeah. I think, um, I don't know. I think it just find something you're interested in and it's probably gonna be more than one thing. Like I was interested in sequencing, but you're gonna have multiple things that can be interesting and you never know when you can actually combine those to do some really cool research. So I think keeping your options open, following what you are interested in, talking to people about the research. Like I know that's super intimidating as a undergraduate student or even as a high schooler, but ask questions, talk to people about the research, find what makes you passionate and go forth. All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us today. And thank you, Morgan, for sharing all these insights with these students. As a reminder, you can watch other speakers in this series on our website at alleninstitute.org slash learn and then click on behind the scenes of science. Um, and I hope that you will be uh, launching onto your science, the next steps of your science journey soon. Thank you again for joining us today and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.